ladies and gentlemen, welcome, 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 as we used to say when we were children and it was Youth Sunday in the Baptist Church. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We thank God for each and every one of you joining on with us, gathering on from around the world. Some of you have already been to church at your home church, and we thank God for you and for your home church. Some of you, you wait till you you come to church with us every week. So many of you. As far as you're concerned, and as far as we're concerned, you're you're part of the family, and we thank God for you, and we appreciate you. Please join with us here as we pray through this service. Please pray for me. Well, let's all stand and turn in our Bible. Most of you have digital Bibles, and contrary to the controversy that some people are trying to create, it doesn't matter whether you're a paper Bible saved or a digital Bible saved, it's all the Word of God, whether it's on papyrus or on a computer screen. power is in the word, no matter what is on it. By the grace of God, ladies and gentlemen, by the power of his Holy Ghost and his Holy Word, I want to briefly Brevity does have its place, or has its place. I want to continue to preach in your hearing Jesus, miracles, and common sense. Jesus, miracles, and common sense. Part two. The Just Jesus Evangelistic Campaign bus rolls on. This is day 1050 since January the 20th, 2017. Day 1354 since January the 1st, 2060. So many of you have been with me many times. good days and bad days, and uh, we thank God for you. Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, at that time Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn. Now you must understand Jesus is the God-man, he is God, so he knew what day it was. Through the corn and his disciples were and hunger. He knew they were hungry as well. And notice that they had the liberty around Jesus to feed themselves. And his disciples were and hungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said, I don't know what the Pharisees were doing in the cornfield on that day, but they were trying to probably catch Jesus in something. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, they didn't say anything to the disciples, they spoke directly to Jesus, Behold thy disciples, 
we are snitching on them. Behold, your disciples, your comrades, your your partners, do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. This might have been the FBI. Secret service of the Pharisees is out there spying on Jesus. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did? And Jesus oftentimes went to this this powerful uh, uh, point. He would ask the people, even the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, have ye not read, you scholars, what David did when he was in hunger and they that were with him? May I say to you lovingly, I, I, I guarantee you, I assure you, you will do yourself a whole lot of good if you read your Bible all the way through and just keep on reading. Have you not read? Because that's what Jesus is going by. The God-man born of a virgin. Emmanuel, God with us. Have you not read what David did when he was in hunger and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law? Again, he uses that same uh, have you not read thing? How that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless. But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Holy Father God, we give you the glory, praise, and honor for the beautiful uh, songs that were sung this morning by your might, by your Thank you, Lord, for our multiple times of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the reading of your holy uh, scripture. And uh, thank you, Lord, for all of the other podcasts that have been done based upon your holy word. And, uh, Lord, we give you the glory, the praise, and the honor for all of it. We praise you and we thank you, Holy Father God, for your love, your grace, and your mercy. Without it, we would not be standing here today. We praise you and we thank you for your Holy Son, uh, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who came to earth and went to the cross, who died for our sins, was buried, and rose on the third day. We give you glory praise and honor. We thank you, Holy Father God, also for you have reminded this poor creature what you have already done down through the years, proclaiming the gospel and preaching your holy word and doing battle. And I give you the glory, praise, and honor and my faith and trust is in you that you will do it again. So, Holy Father God, empty us of ourselves crush and crucify our flesh as Christians, as 
fill us all afresh and new with the fullness and the power of your Holy Spirit. For those who are religious, uh, who only made a profession of faith but never truly believed on you, Lord, open their blinded eyes today. Help them to repent of their sins, of their hypocrisy, and save their souls out of religion as you saved me out of religion and out of church and in spite of the church. Lord, open blinded eyes and unstop deaf ears and protect us all especially from the religious crowd and the devil himself. Lord, we pray that millions would come to know your Savior. Millions of Christians, we pray, seek your face, turn from our wicked ways, and humble ourselves. Lord, I cannot thank you enough for bringing us really, truly. I know it sounds kind of trite and old school, but thank you, Holy Father God, for bringing us a mighty, a mighty, Lord, if it had not been for you, Lord, on our side, we would not have made it. So I give you the glory, praise, and honor. And Holy Father God, as we're going through and facing this plague, and by the way, Lord, all of us deserve to die. Lord, all of us deserve to die and go to hell. I know uh, our newfangled Christians don't like to hear that kind of talk, but that's the reality. If it had not been, for Jesus Christ coming to earth and dying on the cross for our sins, allowing himself to be buried and then rising on the third day by your power and your grace, Lord, we would have no hope. And so, Holy Father God, help all Christians to understand that today. That just because we might be still standing on top of the ground does not mean we deserve to be. It's only by your grace and mercy. Lord, we pray for the millions of family members who are distraught this morning, who are baffled out of their minds and hurt and filled with all kinds of regret and pain. Comfort them as only you can and help them to turn their eyes toward you, Lord Jesus. For you're the only somebody, you're the only somebody who can comfort anybody at a time like this. And you're the only somebody who can save them. Lord, I pray that by the power of your Holy Ghost, millions would be saved today, and your holy name would be glorified, and Jesus Christ exalted. For it is in his name we pray and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ, the first thing I want to say is glory be to God. And if you're still living while so many people are dying all around you, you ought to say the same thing, glory be to God. And thank God for his mercy, his love. Dr. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the Clemson preacher, said, Work done for God on the Sabbath is no real profanation of the Sabbath, though it may seem to be so to those whose religion lies wholly external observances. And we have people like that in the church. It's anything but that. It is about the external. And that's not the real Christianity. 
goes on to say, if we work with Jesus and work for Jesus, we care not for the criticisms of the formalists, the religionists, the religious crowd. Did you uh, not know that true born-again Christians can care less what religious people say? We don't want to have anything to do with folks who are just about religion and not true faith in Christ and obedience to him. As the substance is greater than the shadow, so is our Lord greater than the temple or any or all ceremonial. His sanction overrules all the interpretations of the law, which asceticism or superstition may thrust upon us. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in our last series of messages, as you know, uh, there's been a whole lot of preaching since we have been here. We looked at Jesus' invitation to throw off the heavy yoke of trying to live up to the law in our own power and the burden of sin and find rest and peace and joy for our souls solely in him who has kept the law and who is perfect and sinless. I know it's hard to accept, but this is God's way for us. This is God's grace, God's mercy, and God's love, and you better tap into that if you want to be saved, if you want to experience joy, if you want to have deep down peace and services, someone said that contentment is not a natural thing, bright and early. Contentment is not something that human beings naturally do. You've got to pray for it. You've got to allow God to break you. May God help you, make you, mold you. Oh, that's painful stuff. That's painful stuff breaking, that making, that molding. Some of you right now, you're not content. You're not at peace. You don't have any real joy. You're not settled. Some of you should be. You're old enough in the Lord to be that. You're, you're, but you're not content. And there's something wrong somewhere. And you have to go through the process. It's not anything that comes natural. It's not in our sinful human flesh to be content. But as a child of God, now some of you are not content because you're not born again. You're not saved. Your mind and your eyes are racing like a slot machine in Las Vegas. You're looking for something the next hot thing, uh, the next thing to make you feel good. You're not content. You're not happy. You don't have any joy. You don't have any peace. Because you have not settled down in Jesus. You have never been born again. And you're not growing in that direction of contentment. And by the way, in most cases, if you are born again, child of God, it's going to take a while. It's going to be a while. Because God is taking you through the process of breaking you and making you and molding you. And God has allowed this plague, pandemic, for some of y'all to grow in. Hear me well. Some of you are not doing well. Some of you are mad at God. You're mad at the pastor. You're mad at Jesus. You're mad at the church. 
because the church lied to you and told you that everything was going to be all right and everything was going to be well for you and you're going to prosper and your life is going to be just dandy all of the time. That's a lie out of hell. God didn't lie to you. Jesus didn't lie to you. The Bible, if you read it, it didn't lie to you. Now, some little preacher might have lied to you and told you that lie to get your money. But God did not lie. He cannot lie. Jesus did not lie. He cannot lie. In fact, Jesus said, in this world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Of good cheer. Be of good cheer. God is telling me to tell you right now that this plague pandemic, whatever you want to call it, is probably the best thing that ever happened to you. It probably saved you from a multitude of sins and failures. And some of you know it. You don't like it, but you know it. Faulty plans. Somebody said one time, uh, you want to make God laugh, show him your plans. It's forcing some of you to allow God to continue to chip away at your pride, your pharistic pride, your stubbornness, your rebelliousness, your meanness, your cantankerousness. Break you on down to the ground. Mm -hmm. Spend time with your wife. Spend time with your husband that you both despise. Spend time with your children that some of you mothers hate to do. You cursed and swore that you would never homeschool your children, but God fixed it. Now you are homeschooling your children. You're eating some oatmeal with your children eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich at the table with your children. You're forced to do it. You're out there lying. I just feel so guilty. I I have to put my child in daycare and and everything. And I uh, wish I could spend more time with my baby. Okay, well, you got it now. You got it now, you liar. You got it. You got it now. And walk on through it. Don't run away from it. Don't try to run away from it. Don't try to get away from it. Talking about I need to see other people. I need to see some other grown-ups. No, you, you got enough right there. You got your husband, got your wife, got your children, right? You got enough to take care of. Hang in there with it. Let God continue to break you, make you, and mold you in the plague pandemic. And thank God you're still alive. Because this this thing is a threat to everybody. Yes, more black folk are dying. But there's a whole lot of white folk dying too. Brown folk, yellow folk, red folk. Stay in and stay with your children. And don't just sit down and watch movies all day. Teach your children. Love your children. Spend time with them. Endure how ugly in their behavior they have gotten. Your teacher has had to endure it, now you endure it. And their teachers have had to endure it, now you endure it. Thank God the Sunday school teachers and the the daycare center workers, thank God they're getting a break from your devilish children. That's right, I said it. You're devilish children. They're devilish because you're devilish. And you don't train your children. You're, you think your child is an angel, your child is a devil, and you know it. And you want to throw your children off on other people. Daycare center workers, church daycare center workers, uh, uh, Sunday uh, daycare workers. Uh, I don't know what they call them, nursery uh, workers. Some of you women are mad as the devil because your children are stuck at home with you. You're stuck at home with them. And you use the public school system as a glorified daycare center to watch your devilish acting children. And you 
ought to be ashamed of yourself. Now you got to deal with it. Preacher, I just can't stand you. You never say anything nice and good to me. I do every 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 time I preach. I preach every day, and I share the good news of salvation. Every day. And if you already say nothing should offend you. If you're doing right, praise God. Pray for those who are not. There are many who are not in the church. Even in the ministry. And, and God is shutting it all down to show the to show the if you will, the men from the boys and women from the girls. The real Christians are standing up under it. They're standing strong. In fact, they're excelling. They're fired up and ready to go. Uh, the people who are truly born again, the people who really know Jesus, they, oh, oh yes, oh, yes. <laughs> this, this, they, 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 they were a little bit yeah, kind of shaken by what happened in the beginning. They didn't know what was going on. They, they, they tried to, like that right there, but then they all right, then. Okay, we just roll with it. And they're rolling with it. And guess what? They're sharing the gospel more now than ever before. They're trying to encourage others like never before. They're doing podcasts. They're doing live feeds. They're praying with folk. They're trying to feed folk. They're sending food to... Uh, the frontline workers, they're fired up, I tell you, and they're ready to go. The truly born again ones. But we have some folk who are just religious. They're still confused. They're still baffled. And guess what else they're doing? They're still complaining and whining and cussing and fussing and hoping in politicians, hoping in happy talk preachers instead of Jesus, instead of God. I've told you before, I do a briefing every day. The briefing is more popular than anything else we do. And I tell people all the time, you, you need to get with God and, and stop listening to everybody else. You hear me? This herd mentality, this clannish mentality. You need to you need to pray to God and get your directions directly from Him for your family. And I said it before, and I'm going to, going to say it again. Some of you people need to downsize and and not think that things are going to get back to normal. For most of you, it will not. You need to go and talk with your landlord. You need to go and talk with your mortgage holder and tell them you know what's going on. I'm out. You know what's happening. I'm out. Give me some equity and let me buy a fifth wheel or a motor home or a trailer. I'm out. I'm not going to be doing this because if this is not working out, the game has changed. So let's get real. Now you do what you want. You can go ahead and try to maintain your prosperity gospel life lifestyle if you want to. But I'm telling you, this is not going to go away until the church repents and until family members repent and until the government repents. Now back to the text. <clears throat> Now we move on into chapter 12 of the Gospel of Matthew. But this theme of finding rest in regards to resting on the Sabbath day continues in this sermon. Our passage for this series of messages centers around one of God's laws, commandments which is that of keeping the Sabbath. Like all of God's laws, the law to keep the Sabbath is for our good and should be obeyed. But 
like with all of God's laws, there are legalistic religious people who try to twist God's laws into something they are not at all. And so, beloved, in this passage, we see what happens when the erroneous pharisaical view of the Sabbath is confronted by the true meaning of the Sabbath as dictated by Jesus, who is Lord of the Sabbath. The first thing we see in this passage is the Pharisees' accusation against Jesus and the Sabbath. And like I said, I don't know why the Pharisees or their FBI group were in the field on the Sabbath themselves. What were they doing? The CIA uh, of the Pharisees, what were they doing in the field on, on the Sabbath? Obviously, they were not plucking corn to eat. So what were they doing? The text does not tell us. Other than spying on Jesus. That's all I can get from it. Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were and hungered and began to pluck the ears of the corn and to eat. Now, you know when people get hungry, buddy, and there's some food around, they're going to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. And we have this crowd with us today, the religious crowd, who all they do is watch for external things we're not supposed to do then they get on their case about it. They're not doing it either, but they're hypocrites, they're phonies, and they're fakes. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the Pharisees accused the disciples of Jesus of breaking the Sabbath by picking some fruit from the field to eat. The Pharisees had a biblical basis, of course, for what they accused the disciples. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 34, verse, verse 21, Six days thou shalt work, and on the seventh day thou shalt... Have you lost power? Have you lost our connection? Up or down? Have you lost the internet? Up or down? Well, you, you should not be doing that. Still got power? Okay. But on the seventh day thou shalt rest in hearing time and in harvest thou shalt rest. So even if a farmer's crops were ready, he said, Well, preacher, what now what are you doing? What are you what series is this up? Let me remind you, since I've been preaching so many different things to you. Let me remind you. This is the Just Jesus Evangelistic Campaign. And what we do in the Just Jesus Evangelistic Campaign, the emphasis is on preaching the gospel. But we are doing it in the context of telling the story of Jesus from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you're born again and if you're saved, you're going to like that. If you're not born again and saved, you just hang around to the end of the message and I'm going to share what Jesus Christ did for you personally. That he died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. Now, if you want to learn more about this Jesus and who he is, the God-man, 
the, the true Superman of all time. Okay? Then you need to listen to this series, and then when, you, when we get down to what he did for you, you'll understand more about this man named Jesus. Okay? So that's what we're doing in the Just Jesus campaign. We're introducing you to Jesus, and at the same time, giving you an opportunity to believe on Jesus Christ and get your soul saved from hell and saved to heaven. That's what, that's what the Just Jesus campaign is all about. I was just led of the Lord to, to not just focus on the latter part of the message, but to focus on Jesus Christ himself and tell you the story of Jesus from eyewitnesses, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then I believe that you'll be more apt to accept him as your Savior and believe on him as your Savior. So that's what we're doing. So ladies and gentlemen, even if a farmer's crops were ready to be harvested, it would have been against the law to go and reap the field. But the disciples were not doing any work. They were simply feeding themselves. They were hungry. And they had the liberty, they felt the liberty around Jesus, knowing that Jesus is God in the flesh, uh, to pick the corn and eat the corn. <clears throat> now, you've got to be hungry to pick some corn off the stalk and just sit down and eat it. That's... He didn't even pop the corn. He didn't just, he just he didn't cook it. He didn't cream it. Nothing. You you got to be hungry. Now, when I was a boy, we 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 would eat corn off the cob like that. We didn't have any sense. But that's we we would do stuff like that, you know. Not because we were hungry. Because we could have made a banana sa a sandwich or something like that. We just doing so just feeling people's corn, feeling. I hate to admit it. And just like Augustine said, there's something about stealing somebody else's vegetables and tomatoes and apples and figs that maybe tastes even better. That's just that's just the truth. That's what happened. I was lost and on my way to hell. They didn't break God's law. <clears throat> But the man-made law of the Pharisees. Now let's look at Jesus' response. Jesus gives three examples to the Pharisees to defend his disciples' actions. Then he declares his authority as the Son of God over the Sabbath day. <clears throat> and I can go off on that word authority all day long because uh, one of the reasons why we're in this plague is because people don't respect authority. God's authority, Jesus' authority, the authority at the church, the pastor of the church. Wives don't respect their husband's authority. Children don't respect uh, their parents' authority. People on the job don't respect the boss's authority. We don't respect government authority. And when you, whoever, wherever you are in the food chain, uh, you disrespect God when you don't respect the authority over you. So Jesus had to let them know, I'm the God of the Sabbath. You'll see that later on. So let's look at each of these examples, and we're not going to look at all of them today. Uh, I'm older now. I, I take a long time to, to get to where I want to go, uh, a longer time than what I used to. Uh, it's a matter of age, people. You, know, you just go slower, think slower, therefore you talk slower. I'm going to keep on preaching until I'm dead. First, Jesus gave the example of David and his friends 
eating the consecrated bread of the temple. Now, this was a big deal. Matthew chapter 12, verses 3 and 4 says, But he said unto them, Have ye not read? There he goes with that again. Have ye not read? See, some of y'all, if Jesus came back right now today, he would probably ask you all, Have ye not read? Have you not read Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke, and John? Have you not read the Old Testament? This is the reason why you're acting so crazy and out of order and disobedient and rebellious and mean and hateful. Your family is jacked up and split up and divorced and everything else. Your children are going to... So Jesus would probably say, Have you not read? I left my word with you. I left my word for you. Have you not read? Now, Jesus being God in the flesh, he could have issued new statements and everything else right there off the, off the top of his head. But he said, have you not read? Have you not read? Are you reading your Bible? You know what's wrong with the church today? We don't read the Bible as we should. We don't even know what the Bible says. How are we going to live the godly life, the Christian life, and we don't read the Bible? And you've got to read it, man. You've got to read it for yourself to get it. Do you not know that this country and this world really didn't know what was happening when the plague came, the plague that we're in right now? It's a plague. When you got people dying left and right, from just breathing air. That's a plague. That's not some kind of virus or uh, some scientific thing, some medical condition. That's a plague, man. It's a spiritual matter. God wants people in the family to repent. That's why I'm telling husbands, go leave your girlfriend alone and go back home with your wife and children. I'm telling wives to let their husband back in the house. That's right. People in the church need to repent, especially pastors and priests, for the evil that they have done. And some need to sit down all together, just resign. I told you before the plague hit that if we had about 50 to 60% of the pastors to resign, the church would have revival. I said that many times over the past 10 years. It's documented. Mean, that means that it's written down. It was on recordings. And then the government needs to repent of the evil that it has done. We need to repent. And, and we, there's a ministry called Back to the Bible. It's been around for many years. I used to listen to it quite a bit when I was a young Christian. Uh, then they got a, a new guy, Woodrow Cole, and I just... I couldn't take Woodrow Cole. I, I, he's a good man. I love him. I love everybody. I ain't mad at nobody. I just couldn't take Woodrow Cole. Woodrow Cole would kill me by saying something. Like, at, at the end of the thing, he said, if uh, you're going to have a good day, make sure it's a godly day or something. That, it sounds good, but this, it just didn't do it for me. And I'm sure he's a fine man, a fine man, a fine Christian, probably a better Christian than I am, no doubt. But I just couldn't take Woodrow. I couldn't take Woodrow Cole. I like the man before him. Forget his name now. He was dead and in heaven. He's in the home with the Lord. I believe Woodrow Cole is still living in earnest. So when you tell him, you tell him I love him. But I couldn't, I couldn't take Woodrow Cole. But I love the name of the ministry. Back to the Bible. That's what we need to do. I hope you're doing that right now while you're quarantining instead of doing stupid TikTok videos, dancing and shaking your butt and all this crazy mess and hell. Are you kidding me? No. You don't need to be bothered with that. Get back to the Bible. Start reading three chapters a day in the Word of God. <laughs> Have you not read? That's the problem. Have you not read? Husbands and wives and children, pastors and priests, so-called Christian leaders, government officials. Somebody needs to sit President Trump down and read the Bible with him. 
so he can reverse a whole lot of foolishness the last president did and that he has done and said. And I believe that if, if, if a man of God would point it out to him, he'll change it. I believe he'll change it. If you show it to him in the Bible. Anyway, David did. Have you not read what David did when he was an hunger? And they that were with him. How he entered into the house of God. And did eat the showbread which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. Remember now, the title of this message, my beloved, is Jesus, Miracles, and Common Sense. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees by saying, Have ye not read. And, and, and Jesus was interested in, you're not just reading in general, but reading in detail, paying attention to what you read, so that you will know not to say stupid things like this. If you knew the Bible, you wouldn't do it, and you wouldn't be falsely accusing my people. Have you not read? See, you're ignorant of the scripture. Jesus sent them back to reading the Bible. That's what's wrong with the church today. Have you not read the scriptures? Why are you acting crazy? Why are you doing what you're doing? Why is your family all jacked up? No kind of order, no kind of discipline. Just be allowing all kinds of rebelliousness and stubbornness and attitudes and foolishness. No chastisement, no rebuke. What, what, what? Have you not read that what your children need is a rod of correction on their behind? Have you not read? I told you, I'm giving you permission to do it. I don't care what the, the, the family service has got to say. You better whip their tails or you're going to have a, a devil on your hand threatening you, wanting to kill you. One devilish boy in the day of the plague. Older father was sitting in a chair and evidently, according to the news story, he cut his father up and cooked him and ate him. Cannibalism in New York City. I guarantee you that's a boy who never got his hair wet. The fear of God was not put in him. Some of y'all, y'all raised down in the south. You didn't hear that, y'all. Did you hear that? You, you can't. You turn on all right with your grandmama, my dear, and them whipping you behind, and they whipped you all the way down the street. They pass you right on back down to your mother. Whipped you on the front porch. In the view of all, we didn't have no police officers running around back in those days. Checking and seeing whether or not a grandmother's whipping her child behind. You know what your grandmother would have said? Call them. Here's the phone. Call them. Call somebody. If you've heard about it in school. And we'll see whether or not you have any fingers when you pull it back from that phone. I'd dump a dog there. You'd call somebody on me. And then she would proceed to whip your behind with a braided switch. You need some more switches. That's what you need. Get your switch. Keep it in your house. You'd be better off getting a rod of correction, a little paddle. That when you when when you when you hit that behind, it sounds off. Paya. God gives you permission to do it. You know why God gives you permission to do it? He wants you to do it. In fact, he commands you to do it because you're gonna whip your behind if you don't do what he tells you to do. That's why. Okay. <laughs> now he's gonna do his job. Right now, a whole lot of folk getting their behinds whipped by God. God just stopped everything. This is the way of life, my beloved. You cannot have peace in a home if you don't use the rod of correction. If you don't rebuke somebody to, to make things peaceful in the house for everybody else. 
And while you're trying to keep the peace by not saying anything, letting devils just run around acting crazy and hitting on each other and causing a problem, the people that you're supposed to be raising and protecting, they are going to grow up and despise you and not want to have anything to say to you because you allowed foolishness and rebelliousness and stubbornness and confusion in the house. Now, I thank God, as far as I know, not for some reason, they got some other issues that I had to deal with. But thank God, as far as I know, I never had a child hit on another child, hit another child in my family or fight another child. None of that to this day. I don't know why that is, but I thank God it was that way. So I never had to whip a child for hitting somebody. But, but, but I guess they knew that if you ever, if, if you ever, if you, if you ever hit one of my children and you a child too, oh, you was going to get your ass whipped. Excuse me. I guess they knew it instinctively. If they, if they were getting whipped for lying and whipped for stealing the cookie out of the cookie jar, whipped for stealing the peanut butter out of the peanut butter thing from stealing it from other children, I guess they knew. I better not hit nobody. That's when I would have gone off in love. I never, I never, I, what? <laughs> they, said, they, they knew that, I guess they knew instinctively that their father was crazy enough that it was going to be, it was going to be in a butt whipping like never before if you hit one of these children, my children, even if you're my child. Mm -hmm. I, I uh, 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 several times I told my wife, don't don't be dealing with these children in anger. No, 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 uh -uh. no, no, nope, no, no. Don't be, don't be trying to show out and, 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 and dealing with these children in anger. We're not going to have that up in here, in my house. So, back to the text. As the Jewish religious leaders, they would know of this event, which is told in 1 Samuel chapter 21. Uh, verses 1 through 6. When David and his men were on the run from King Saul, they took sanctuary in the temple. And David asked the priests for food. The priests only had the hollowed showbread and gave it to David even though it was technically against the law. This is why you need to read the Word. You need to read the Word, and you need to do what the Word tells you, and you need to read it in detail. Like I was telling you, most people did not know this was a plague. But because I have read the Word, I knew this was a plague. Right from the jump street, I was the first one to call it a plague. Now the president is the only other person that I know of calling it a plague. President of these United States. That is not a polit politically correct term. They don't want you to say that in politics. They don't want you to say that in the media. And he knows it. Because the plague indicates that we have done something wrong against God Almighty and God is not pleased. Even with the great America the U.S. of A. That's what the plague means. That we need to repent. That somebody better start praying and stop playing and humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways and let go of your girlfriends and stop living in adultery. We got just as many people today not just committing adultery but living in adultery. This is, this is displeasing to God whether you think so or not. And just because your pastor said it's okay does not mean it's okay. 
God is not pleased with this. This foolishness, setting up children to be molested by stepfathers and stepmothers and all this foolishness going on. Dr. John MacArthur said every, and these are the easy sins that you need to repent of. These are the easy things you, you need to get out of. They're hard, but they're, they're, they're easy. You just got to say, text them, say, listen, I can't see you anymore. When they text you back and say, why can't you? Just say, I can't. And say with an exclamation point, I can't. That's all you say. And they try to call you, and they try to talk to you, say, I can't. I can't. Uh, I'm going back to my husband. I'm going back to my children. And you need to do the same. We should have never done this. And now we're in the plague, and here you are still trying to get with me. We can't. We can't. And nobody can say, I can't, like a black woman. I, I can't. When they start doing like this, and, and, and by the way, when the when the woman start looking out into the middle distance when you're trying to talk to her, you done, Jack. Once she start looking out into the middle distance, she's not looking at you anymore, and she's not enamored with you anymore, and God done got a hold of her heart, and she's through with you, and she's looking out in the middle distance, and she's saying, I can't, you are done. Stop talking, sir. <laughs> she's through. And when she says, I can't for that 14th time, then she gives up, you are done. You don't need to keep trying to talk to her. God has got to hold her heart, and she, she, don't, she does not want any more chastisement from God. She fears God. And she ain't thinking about you right now. She's looking at what she done messed up and how she done fouled up her life, um, fooling around with you. Mr. Boo Peep, Dr. John MacArthur, said every week they bake 12 loaves of bread, and each loaf was baked with six and a half pounds of flour. My soul, what kind of bread was this? Show bread. And they were put in two rows or two piles of six each, and they represented the 12 tribes of Israel, and they were placed on this table. Every Sabbath, the loaves would be taken away, and new loaves put down. And when the loaves were taken away according to Leviticus, Chapter 24, have you not read? Verses 5 through 9, have you not read? They were to be eaten by the priests. And they were to be eaten by no one else but the priests. The word showbread really literally means the bread of presence. Or the continual bread. And it was the representation of God's perpetual relationship to his people. And it was to be eaten, eaten only by the priests. It was sacred, never to be touched, or never to touch the lips of a common person, even a person like David. Because he wasn't a priest. But David ate the showbread. I mean, I can't think of a parallel unless you went into the Catholic Church and drank all the holy water or the communion wine or ate the uh, communion bread, unleavened bread, because you were thirsty and hungry. I mean, they might get upset at you for that. And probably those guards they have at the Catholic Church, the Vatican, just up like jokers, Swiss guard. 
they'll run you out of there. They'll probably grab you and, 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 and pick you up and take you on out real quick. Like. But David ate the showbread, and so did his men. It sounded like it was some pretty good bread as well. How come God let him do this? Because God never invented any law that was intended to overrule human need. And ceremony takes a back seat to the meeting of human need. God not only allows necessity to overrule ritual, but the ritual in David's time and in our Lord's time had lost its meaning anyway because the people were so unholy and so ungodly and so wicked as we are today. And by the way, back to the quote I shared with you, uh, the story I shared with you about two weeks ago, two Sundays ago. See, the religious crowd... They'll pass by a row of homeless people, for example, who are begging for food to eat, obviously hungry and destitute, sitting on the church steps with hundreds of dollars in their pocket to tithe and give to the to God through the church, which is which is what we should do. They'll pass by those people. And lie and say, I don't have any money because I, I do have some, but I'm going to give it to God. When God would probably want them to bring them on in the church, use some of that money, go out and get some food for them, some church's chicken, how fitting would that be? And let them sit down and eat and, and take less money from you. You just give less. You, but you take care of these people right here who need some help. Obviously, they're sitting on the church staff staircase see God does not want us to not have common sense amen somebody Jesus the law miracles and common sense one of the things that I loved about the Christian faith when I got first when I was first born again was that it was a logical faith. And, 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 and you can have common sense in this faith. And, and, and at that time where I got saved, uh, this all made sense to me, uh, contrary to what the church has become. We're not even using common sense in the church today. And that's why we got so much mess going on. Can I just uh, share a little common sense with you? If you got a pastor, young young pastor, young wife, and in their thirties, forty, whatever, he does not need a fly uh, secretary sitting in the next office. When I say fly, for some of you all, I mean you know a fine young woman just as young as his wife. That's, that's not even common sense. That's why we, get, we end up with a whole bunch of mess. Oh, sure, he ought to be able to handle it. He's a man of God. He can't handle that if she's all that. You know what you need, what, what common sense is? Common sense, you know what common sense is? Common sense says, get you an older woman, been married for 50 years, Husband still living, heavy set, and let her be the pastor's secretary. See, you know, well, well, praise the Lord, we we all saved and we love Jesus, and uh, we all be able to handle that, and should not be a problem. We don't even have common sense. No, you can't handle it. Obviously, you cannot handle it because that's why we got a bunch of mess going on right now in the church. And don't let the pastor pick her. I remember one time uh, we had led to this uh, wonderful couple to the Lord at a church plant and uh, 
church was doing great at the time, and and it just so happened that she was extraordinarily beautiful. What 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 uh, the young men would say today, all over the place, fine, and just and bubbly, cheerful, great attitude, wanted to serve. Newly saved, on fire for God, and her husband was a good guy, and and I'm sure w- women would say that he was a handsome man, as well, and and they they're a wonderful couple, just a wonderful couple. They loved the Lord, and they they wanted to serve in the church, and uh, one day the wife came by, and she was just so excited about serving the Lord at the church, and so forth. And she said, I noticed that you don't have a secretary. She's talking to me. Her husband was not there, and we were outside. I was getting ready to go home or something, and she pulled in, and, and, and we both stayed in our car. She said, I noticed you don't have a church secretary. I would love to be the church secretary. And I looked at her, and this is, this is the truth. I started laughing. I had to control myself. I started laughing. She, there was no way she could know why I was laughing. I started laughing. I said, ma'am, no, we don't, uh, we don't need a church secretary. I was laughing because I knew what the devil was trying to do. The devil was trying to set me up, and, uh, and, and I laughed because I said, look at this devil here. Not her, the devil. We don't need her down at the church as a church secretary. We don't need to be interacting. See, we don't even have common sense in our churches today. We got men hooking up with women in the church. They're both married and going on trips together. Are you kidding me? Talking about we're doing the Lord's work with all this talk of equality and all this mess. No, 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 no. Excuse me, but you need an ugly secretary, sir. To preach you ought not to say that. No, you need an old secretary that's heavyweight, a heavy set and uh, been married for 50 years and raised their children, and you don't need that. And everybody who has common sense knows you don't need no fine, fly, fat secretary walking around there, bouncing around in, in your office. Y'all out at the church by yourself sometimes. You don't need that. That does not make any sense. You're trying to act more spiritual than what you are. And you're jeopardizing two families and the church. And you know what you're doing. Don't let the pastor hire the, the, the church secretary or the pastor secretary or whatever. And, and nine times out of ten, why can't the wife be the secretary? I know it's going to be uncomfortable. Let the wife be the pastor secretary. But that, that makes more sense than hiring some uh, college educated, I mean, college aged young lady. Jesus, the law, miracles, and common sense. Anyway, listen. God will even allow for the breaking of one of his own ceremonial uh, laws. We're not talking about moral laws here at this point. God will... However, even uh, allow for a ceremonial law uh, to be broken, if you will, if he has to, to meet a human need, because God is all about loving human beings and meeting their needs. God is not mad with the disciples for picking some corn on on Saturday uh, when they were hungry. And they didn't have any food to eat. And God was with them. Jesus Christ. And you see the Pharisees didn't understand this. They didn't understand what Mark adds. The Sabbath was made for man. So he could rest and have his needs met not man for the 
Sabbath. If you will, David violated the ceremonial law to fulfill the heart of God. And the heart of God is to meet needs. Why? Shocker of shockers. God loves people. I can't even do that justice. But God loves people more than you'll ever know. And he loves, he loves people who are, who are without. God loves the poor. If you read your Bible, have you not read? Have you not read? And we got some folk in, the, in, in, in evangelical circles who need to read the word of God again. God is concerned about the poor. God made provisions for the poor from the beginning all the way through the Bible. He's concerned about the poor. Every law that God has ordained is for man's good and benefit. None of God's laws will harm us. They're not made to harm us or to hurt us. And they're not grievous. The word of God says, have you not read? They're for our good. See, this is why God has to chastise us and rebuke us and get on our case. He's not trying to stop your fun, like some your your fun, like some of you people think. He wants you to have more fun. That's why he has to put the brakes on our foolishness, our sin, and our evil. For example, I know you don't want to hear it, but God has set boundaries. You cannot commit abominations. I have given you a way to enjoy sex inside the bonds of marriage between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. That's it. You can have all the fun inside those boundaries you want to have. Do whatever you want to. The the marriage bed is undefiled. I, 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 God is everywhere, but I, I personally believe that God kind of turns his back when a man and a woman is together. Unless he thinks somebody's going to try to hurt somebody. And he, he'll deal with that. But I believe God would just pretty much, he pretty much leaves you alone in the marriage bed, which is undefiled. I believe he just goes out the room. If he can trust you. Let you have your way. But there are boundaries. People who are not married can't do that. You're not supposed to be having sex with family members, even in step families. It's against God's law and it's against the law, period. And it should be against your moral law on the inside of you, your conscience. You cannot have uh, 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 sex with men and men together, women and women together. There are boundaries that God has set. And if you don't obey his commandments and his laws and his boundaries, he will lay the boom down on you to stop all the fun. That's that's, uh, outside of his will. Until you confess your sins, until you repent, until you apologize, until you get your heart right with God, until you turn from your wicked ways, until you humble yourself, and until you turn back to Jesus, your first love, and act like you have some common sense. And if you don't do that, the party is over. While some people are still talking, saying, uh, let's get this party started, there's no party. It's over. And if you don't repent, it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse until the whole country is destroyed and desolate. And don't tell me God won't do it because he has. By the way, let me help you people. Let me help you Americans. You great Americans. We who love America so much, and I love it more than anybody. God has blessed me here in America. But let me let you in on a secret. God, I mean, uh, the USA, 
America is not in prophecy. Like Israel, Russia, and other places. And what that means to me is God can and will destroy America if he has to. Because I heard somebody say a long time ago that God would have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah if he does not destroy America. God is not in the apologizing business, but I hope you're getting a taste of the wrath of God enough to repent. But as I said in the beginning of this plague, People in the church, people in the family, people in the government of America is not, they're not in a repenting mood. And so this play can last even by secular doctor standards. I, I've heard doctors say this. This thing can go on for three or four years. And like, like Dr. the overworked Dr. Sandre Gupta says, every day. Now, you can, he said, you can go ahead on and try to get the economy started again and go trying to go back to normal all you want. But the virus is still out there. That's what the humble Dr. Uh, Sandre, Sandre Gupta says every day. You, I mean, whatever you, you want, you want to go back to football stadium, baby, go ahead right ahead. But the virus, this coronavirus, is still out there killing people. So you better deal with that. And he says it in a very nice and sweet way, but you better deal with that. And by the way, they're talking about bringing baseball back without the fans. You know what I say? Baseball, they don't have any fans anyway in the crowd. They can, they, baseball can be played without people because they normally are played without people. I thought I'd just tell you that. Football, not so much. Basketball, no. Baseball and golf, have at it. Anyway, we are, or rather, we in our sinfulness may find God's laws oppressive because their holiness goes against our sinful nature. And that's where we are today. Religious legalists twist God's laws to oppress man even more for their own benefit and to make themselves appear to be holy when they won't lift a finger to obey it themselves. If David could break a law that was actually ordained by God to feed himself, how much more could the disciples break a man-made religious tradition to feed themselves? Work out of necessity is allowed on the Sabbath. Jesus. Miracles. The law. And common sense. If you read your Bible, you will, listen to me very carefully, if you're saved and you're born again, and you read the Bible, you will find that it is full of common sense. You'll see some miracles, things done out of the ordinary. Glory be to God. But much of the Bible is just plain old common sense. You do evil, you're going to be punished. You do right, you do good, you're going to be blessed. And that's a fact, my beloved. One hymn writer said these words. Lord of the Sabbath and his light, I hail thy hollow day of rest. It is my weary soul's delight, the solace of my careworn breast. O sacred day of peace and joy, thy hours are ever dear to me. Never may a sinful thought destroy the holy calm I find in thee. How sweetly now they glide along. How hallowed is the calm they yield. 
transporting is their rapturous song, and heavenly visions seem revealed. O Jesus, let me ever hail thy presence with the day of rest. Then will thy servant never fail to deem thy Sabbath doubly blessed. Let's all stand for prayer. Holy Father God in heaven, we praise you and we thank you, Lord, for your amazing and holy word. Anywhere we cut it, it is rich and powerful and meaningful and reaches people on every level and uh, very deeply in their hearts, their minds, their souls, their spirits. Lord, it is inexplicable how powerful your holy word is. And it is amazing how that you can take one message and speak to the hearts of thousands in different ways. And so I give you glory, praise, and honor for your holy word. I give you glory, praise, and honor for your Holy Ghost that makes your holy word plain. And your Holy Ghost who takes your holy word and applies it to the hearts of people. And we thank you most of all for your Holy Son, Jesus Christ, and our Savior. For salvation, full and free through him. Lord, help those who don't know him to come to know him as Savior today, wherever they are in the world. For your gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Open blinded eyes, unstop deaf ears, and save those who are lost, particularly in this time <clears throat> when people, red, yellow, black, and white, are dying all across the country and around the globe. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you're with us today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in the free pardon of your sins, allow me to show you how you can place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation from the power of sin and the punishment of sin, which is the eternal burning hell. First, accept the fact that you are a sinner and that you have broken God's laws. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Second, Accept the fact that there is a penalty. There is a severe punishment for sin. The Bible states in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. When the body dies, when we die, our bodies go to the grave. Our soul goes to either heaven or hell depending on whether or not you trusted and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ in this life. So thirdly, accept the fact, dear friend, that you are on the road to hell. Jesus Christ said in Matthew, 10, uh, Matthew 18, verse 8, Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed 
rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Hell is a very real place, my dear friend. Hell is a place like Kansas is a place. And hell is a sad place. Hell is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Hell is a place of darkness. Hell is a place of pain. Hell is a place of torment. Hell is a place of an agonizing memory. And the saddest aspect of hell to me is that once you go to hell, you will never have a second chance. You will never come out. There's no purgatory. There's no limbo. There's nobody who can pray you out of it. You will be in hell forever. So hell is bad news, my dear friend. And you need to understand that before you die. And each and every one of us in this country, we're under, for the first time in our lifetime, we're under the threat of death. Hell is bad news, but I have some good news for you. You don't have to go to hell. You have to die, but you don't have to go to hell. You can go to heaven. For the Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Just believe in your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ. That he died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose from the dead by the power of God for you. So that you can live forever with him. Pray and ask him to come into your heart to save your soul and he will save you. Romans 10, 9 and 13 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou, you, shalt be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. Saved to what? Saved to heaven. And I emphasize that because when I was growing up in the church, both the Baptist church and the Pentecostal Holiness Charismatic Church, my dad was a Baptist preacher, my mother was a Pentecostal holiness preacher. That's how they were raised, and that's what they were. And I was a member, we were members of three churches. Two Pentecostal holiness charismatic churches and one Baptist church. No one ever told me while growing up what being saved really meant. It was all about if you were saved, you didn't wear makeup or you, you wore long dresses or you didn't smoke or you didn't drink or something like that. It was all about what we did here, and nothing about our future life. And so therefore, I never got saved because I never understood what being saved meant. I thought it was a bunch of religious mumbo-jumbo. Until December the 19th, 1979, and somebody showed me from the Bible what being saved really means. And on that day, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. For the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I believed in my heart on Jesus Christ on that night, December the 19th. 1979, and I prayed and asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart to save me from hell 
and from the lake of fire. And to save me to heaven. For the first time I understood what being saved meant. You're actually being saved from something very, very bad. And that is hell. <clears throat> yes, God will do some things for you in this life. But he wants to get you to heaven to be with him. To fellowship with him in a very real sense. Like, it, like he's always wanted to do. So, dear friend, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou, you, shall be saved. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ suffered, bled, and died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose on the third day. And pray and ask him to save you. If you're doing that in your heart right now, please pray with me this simple prayer called the Sinner's Prayer. And I, I, my mind has been on this song for a while. Find that song uh, called The Sinner's Prayer. I forget the guy's name, a young guy. Uh, and, and let's play that right after uh, the services. The Sinner's Prayer. Repeat after me, phrase by phrase, and mean it from your heart. Holy Father God, wherever you are in the world, you don't have to be in the church to get saved. You can get saved right where you are. You can be in a hospital bed. You can be in your bed. You can be on your couch. You can be outside. Just bow your head and pray this prayer and mean it from your heart, believing in your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ. Holy Father God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner and that I have done evil in your sight. For I have broken your Ten Commandments. For I have lied before. I admit that I've stolen things before. I admit that I have coveted and lusted after people in my heart and things as well. I admit that I have dishonored and disrespected and I've had a bad attitude towards my parents. I also admit that I have taken your holy name in vain. I have done evil in your sight. A holy Father God, and you know that that's just five of your Ten Commandments that I have broken. I've sinned in many other ways, as you know. And I understand that I deserve to go to hell. Just like a criminal deserves to go to jail. For Jesus Christ's sake, please forgive me of all of my sins. As I now believe with all of my heart on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died for my sins, was buried, and rose on the third day. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and save my soul. I receive your free gift of salvation that I do not deserve. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to repent of my sins past. And help me to turn from my evil life and to follow you in the new life. Lord Jesus, for it is in your name I pray Amen. Now, dear friend, if you believed in your heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, that he was buried and that he rose on the third day, allow me to say to you congratulations on doing the most important thing in life, and that is trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. For more information to help you grow in your newfound faith in Christ, please go to gospellightsociety.com and read my pamphlet titled, What to Do After You Enter Through the Door. Jesus Christ said in John 10, 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. If you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, please email us at dw3 at gospellightsociety.com 
or one of our many other emails that may be on your uh, platform where you are. And let us know. We have some free material that we want to send you. If you have a prayer request, please email us that prayer request, and we will pray for you until you tell us to stop. Until next time, beloved, God loves you, we love you, and may God bless you real good is my prayer. Uh, since today is not Easter Sunday, I will be doing the coronavirus plague briefing in about 10 minutes. We're going to shut everything down and come back in about 10 minutes to do that. Invite others uh, who you might think need encouragement during this time and understanding as to what they're dealing with. Let's all stand for our closing word of prayer. Holy Father God, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you for what you have done here today. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love. Thank you for the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit and your Holy Word. And thank you, Lord, for doing for us what we can't do for ourselves. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayers. Thank you for saving those who were lost. Thank you for encouraging those who are saved. And thank you, Lord, for people who stand with us uh, in their own way. And we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that... Uh, you will lead us, guide us, and direct us throughout the remainder of this day. Please receive all glory, praise, and honor to yourself, for all of it is due your name. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. God bless you, dear friends. Until next time. Save you.